Hello all, and uh, thank you so much for attending this third in our continuing education series for, for Medmont. Um, Randy will be covering today uh, case studies in advanced topography for fitting specialty contact uh, lenses. Randy, thank you so much once again for doing this webinar. Sincerely appreciate your time as always. Hey Chris, this, I'm hoping this will be fun for everybody and thanks for, for having me. Pleasure, pleasure indeed. Um, I'd also like to uh, thank our co-sponsors, uh, NIDEC USA, iVinci in the Netherlands, number seven contact lenses in the UK, Medcornia in Russia, Cooper Vision Soflex in Israel, um, Belgium Optical Supply, obviously in Belgium, Conlens in Denmark, and also Belosa in Austria. Uh, over to you, Randy, and again, thanks again for everybody for their participation in this event. This talk today is on advanced topography for fitting specialty contact lenses. And again, my name is Randy Kojima. What we did was we took basically about 10 patients virtually in a row, 10 consecutive patients that we had performed topography on and just pulled out of those cases what we might discuss. What was interesting about these particular topographies and these particular conditions that um, would be good discussion points for us to have. So I, I hope you like this format that's a little more workshop style. Now here's the first case. And I might ask you, is this a diseased eye? And I'd look at that topography and I'd say, that looks like a pretty droopy corneal apex. It's pretty steep relative to the superior cornea. Um, is that a disease cornea or is it just a droopy corneal apex? So could you say at this point, just looking at that topography, that you could definitively say it's diseased or not diseased? Well, what we're going to need more than just the topography. We don't have any reference point. We don't have any radii as an example to draw any conclusions from. So let's focus in on the pupil here and look at the distribution of power across the flat meridian. And there's some asymmetry to the way the powers are distributed from this point across to this point. So clearly that should create some aberration for the patient, some uh, reduced quality of vision. Maybe this patient can still get 6-6 six, six vision, but to, it, it would be expected that this tilt in the power of the eye would hinder the patient from being able to achieve, say, better than 6-6 six, six vision. What about in the steepest and most asymmetric meridian? Let's again focus in on that pupil area. And going north, we read about 4425 in the superior pupil. Going south, about 4575. So basically, we're clicking on this point and this point to determine what is the power spread across the pupil. And there's really only one and a half diopters of power distributed across this eye. That's, that's not so significant. One would presume that that's pretty common in the population and, and therefore good quality of vision should be possible for this patient. What else could we look at that might steer us in the direction of a definitive answer? Well, let's look at the scale range. This is one of the more easy and efficient tools to determine if you're looking at an irregular cornea. And what we're, just, we're having an appreciation of is the steepest curvature is at the top of the graph, the flattest curvature at the bottom of the scale here. So there is approximately a seven, almost eight diopter distribution of power across this cornea. Now we know that normal corneas have about 10 diopters or less of power distributed. So this patient is in that less column, at least in terms of the power distributed across the eye, this would be considered a normal uh, distribution. So when you think about it, is it regular or is it irregular, just go to your axial topography in a normalized scale. Normalized meaning it's going to adjust the scale specific for the topographies, the topography that you've displayed. In this case, 
the steepest we can read is almost 46, flattest we can read is 38. If we picked another cornea, it would completely switch up the scale. Now, what else could we look at? How about the eccentricity? What is E value? That is a measure of the rate of corneal change from the center to the periphery of the eye. If the cornea is keratoconic with a steep volcano that's popping out, going to the periphery in a very high rate of change as we go to normal flat peripheral cornea, then we should see an ultra high eccentricity. But this patient's indicating they have a pretty normal 0.6 E value. In a study of about 500 normal eyes, we found that the average eccentricity for a Medmont was 0.65 to 0.67, somewhere in that range was considered the middle of the bell curve. Now, most of the studies you've seen on eccentricities, at least in the textbooks, would suggest that normal E value is 0.55. And that's because the early topographers really took a relatively small area of sampling. So they may have captured four millimeters from center at the most, whereas a Medmon is getting around 10 millimeters. So met normal eccentricity for a Medmon about 0 0.65, 0 0.67, normal for a large cone topographer that measures a small area about 0.55. Now, what else could we look at? Of course, the disease detection indices are always a good consideration because they're looking at specific known and appreciated thresholds of irregularity. And the IS, SAI value are both lit up in red. The surface regularity looking at the powers within the pupil, the distribution of shape within the area that the patient would look through is considered normal. So we have two of the three disease detection indices saying this patient is an abnormal eye. Now, what about the height? And one of those values that can be helpful, especially related to specialty contact lenses, is to understand sagittal depth. And at a 10 millimeter cord, we know from OCT studies that the normal corneal sagittal depth in the middle of the the um, bell curve is about 1,750 microns. And this patient is coming up about 1,810 to 1,850 roughly. So around 50 to 100 microns higher in depth than the normal cornea. Now that might indicate some abnormality in the eye shape, that this is a more bulging eye, at least by 50 to 100 microns. But that's not a severe amount of height. I wouldn't say that's an extreme amount. Uh, my eye, as an example, is in the 1800 micron range and, and I'm a diseased free cornea at the very least. So I'm not sure we have the answer based on purely sagittal depth. But topographically, I think we can say for this eye that some of the disease detection indices are lighting up in indicating that we have an irregular cornea. So this may be a borderline case. This is certainly somebody we should be following and um, looking at the other signs as well. Of course, what is the quality of vision? What are the slit lamp signs for this patient? But you get some sense of how we might use topography. Here we can't definitively say that this is an irregular cornea. We can certainly say it's a droopy corneal apex. And we can say that some of the disease detection indices are suggesting possibly a, a diseased eye. Now what about here? What do you think the condition is in this case? And certainly it's looking like we have a true keratoconic patient, but there's a fairly irregular shape to the way the cone goes from steepest here to flattest. It's not very common for the corneal surface to have its steepest point and its flattest point within a millimeter of each other. Normally, corneas flatten at a, a relatively constant or smooth rate, even in an advanced condition like a advanced keratoconic patient. 
So are there any clues to understand this case? And you can pull up the Placido and get a sense of what we're looking at in this topography. Let's just zoom in on the center. Notice how those central at least three to four rings have completely collapsed. And then we might take some of these going out to maybe eight or 10 rings have all collapsed on each other. And what that means is that data points can't be recognized one from the other. Along each one of these rings is a specific number of data points. Obviously the smallest ring in the center will have the least data points. The farthest ring out will have the most data points. Now, as those rings collapse and cross over each other, that's going to make it difficult for the topographer to distinguish one ring from the next and one data point from the next. So this is an erroneous topography. We need to do something about this kind of what you might call ring jam, where the rings jam up together. So what we could what could we do to improve the quality of this topography? Now this was corneal staining that was causing this was uh, part of me scarring that was causing this distortion in the placido. So for this patient, we have to find a way to smooth that over, and that's pretty difficult when we are using an instrument that's going to reflect off the tear film that's on top of our scarred up cornea. So one of the things you can try is artificial tear that will often smooth over the rings a little bit. But if you have a highly scarred cornea, a consideration might be to put on a really low modulus soft lens, something low in power, and I would usually use a plus lens. I'd rather think the cornea is slightly steeper and fit my, my contact lens steeper than, um, than, than the possible real shape rather than flatter. I'd rather risk apical clearance than risk touch. So try doing topography over the soft lens when you run into some scarring like this. Now that should be a good sign when you see a topography that shows the flattest point and the steepest point within a millimeter, that's usually a very good indicator that something is wrong with the topography. And as we said, we normally expect to see a more gradual rate of flattening. And that's what we see in this case. Here we have another keratoconic patient, steepest here, flattest here, separated by maybe four millimeters. Now, is it possible that this is topographical error. Could this little divot or flat spot in the eye that's within a millimeter of the steepest spot, could that be indication that we have some kind of topographical error due to corneal staining, corneal scarring, poor tear film? And really here we're seeing this very gradual rate of flattening. Notice on the graph, when you cut the axis line across the steepest curvature, the eye has this most curved point, but then gradually it gets flatter and flatter. So that tells me that the topography is likely doing, or it gives me some confidence that the topographer is doing a good job at interpreting the eye shape. Well, let's look at the placido and let's verify that we have good ring reflection. And you're seeing that from the center to the periphery, we're seeing excellent reflection of the rings. They all appear parallel and there isn't any obvious signs of ring jam or distortion. Now, if we were to zoom in, you might notice how the rings over the cone appear very close to each other. Whereas as we go out to the farther periphery where the cornea is flatter, you see this greater spread. And that's pretty typical. You should notice when you see your placido reflections that the, where the cornea is steepest, the rings will appear thinnest and closest together. Whereas when we hit flatter cornea, the rings may widen out a little bit and they may stretch out in between rings. So I think based on the placebo reflection, we're looking at the true shape of the eye. So is this a diseased eye? Or is this just a very peaked apex, a little bit inferior of center? Uh, 
Well, let's look at the analysis. What would be first on the list? And again, we might go to the scale range. And in this case, this eye has a flattest curvature of 39 diopters, steepest curvature of almost 52. So there's around a 11 to 12 diopter distribution uh, of power. So this is above our threshold of 10 diopters of power distribution. That would certainly be indication that we have an irregular cornea. Remember that you want to view these topographies in axial, an axial scale with a normalized scale. If you're using tangential, the scale range is going to be much broader and that's going to give you a, a false distribution of that power. Now, what else could we look at? Of course, the K readings. Here we see the flat K, about 47 diopters. So we're looking at a very steep cornea. That could very much be indication that this is a true diseased eye. When we look at the eccentricity value, we said that a normal E value is about 0.65, and this cornea is indicating a 0.92 E value. Looking at hundreds of keratoconic patients, they typically show eccentricities over 0.8 E value, and certainly this patient is over that threshold of 0.8. What else? We go to the disease detection indices, all lit up in red. So that's a definite indicator that this patient is above the threshold in all of the disease detection indices. Now let's go down to the EH cords. And what that stands for is estimated height. And you might use this for your scleral lenses. You punch in the core diameter of measure of your scleral lens. And what does that mean? Well, if you have a sagittal depth labeled on your scleral lens, the question you want to ask yourself is what diameter is that sagittal depth recorded over? So in this case, the lens I'm using is a 16.5 diameter lens that measures or calculates its sagittal depth at 15 millimeters. So then I understand the height of the eye to a 15 millimeter cord. So Medmont is giving you an EH estimated height to a diameter of 15 millimeters. And it's telling us that the sagittal depth of the eye across these three axes is around 4,000 microns. So that helps, helps me to understand which scleral lens we should pull out of the set. And a normal sagittal depth at a 15 millimeter cord is 3,750 microns. So normal corneal height to a 15 millimeter cord, 3,750. This eye is 250 microns higher than the norm. So that's a really good indication that we have a much higher depth than the normal eye. And then if we look at the corneal height alone, so this is estimating the anterior chamber and this lower analysis is really only looking at 10 millimeters. And we see that the corneal sagittal depth is about 1,850 to about 1,960. So that's around 100 to 200 microns higher than the norm. So again, a lot of the indicators, um, basically all of them are indicating that this is an irregular eye. So when we consider uh, plans for fitting this patient, we're assuming that vision is going to be hindered because we have a relatively irregular cornea. But could a soft keratoconic lens be used, a custom soft? Is it possible that it could mask the irregularity that we're looking at? Well, let's find the flattest point we can read, 39 and a quarter. So we're taking this dark gray area of the graph across the most irregular axes of the eye. And within the pupil, we see 30, sorry, 43 and a quarter diopters, steepest point, 5175. That's an 18 and a half diopter distribution of power 
within this cornea, within this pupil. I'm thinking a soft keratoconic lens is going to really struggle to mask that astigmatism, that rigid lens optics are most likely the best call for this patient. Now let's go to the elevation map. It appears that we need a rigid lens optic of some sort, a piggyback, a hybrid lens, a, a corneal GP, a scleral. We need something that is going to be able to manage or mask that astigmatism. Well, the elevation map can give us perspective on which way to go. Do we go corneal GP or do we go scleral? What we're going to do is find the highest point of curvature along a single axis. So across this meridian where there's the greatest rate of change, we see that the eye has 53 microns positive elevation at this point. It has minus 70 microns negative elevation at this point. So that is a change in elevation, an absolute shift of about 123 microns. Now, what does that mean to you? Well, our research at Pacific shows when the elevation difference is 350 microns or less, the eye is not so asymmetric that a corneal GP may work quite well. So when the elevation difference is over 350, when the height difference from this point to this point is greater than 350 microns, then a corneal GP is going to struggle much more. And a scleral lens might be a good choice for the patient as your first step. Now let's put on a corneal GP in the contact lens software. Let's get a sense of if a corneal GP will look appropriate. Does it appear that it has hope of being successful? Are we confident that a lens, a corneal GP might work? And here we're seeing a relatively acceptable pattern. We have apical clearance. We're able to clear over top of the cone. We've got what appears to be three pivot points or three landing points for the contact lens. Across the flat meridian, we see the lens touching down at nine o'clock. On the opposing side, the lens is lifting off. So that's a bit of bad news. We'd ideally like to see our rigid contact lenses touch down at nine o'clock and three o'clock so that they will be laterally stable. And with the blink, we're going to have this natural vertical movement um, from the lid force and gravity. In this case, on the opposing meridian, you notice that these two points here where the lens comes into contact are possibly going to limit the movement of the contact lens vertically. We may not have the ideal tear pump, but I do feel confident that the lens has these beautiful three points to land on and distribute its force and be stable and hopefully be centered. So I'm thinking corneal GP appears like it has a good shot. The elevation map is telling us there's 123 microns of differential. That's well below our threshold of 350. And the contact lens software is saying the lens looks very confident. So for this patient, uh, corneal GP would be the way to begin. But if you needed or felt like scleral was the best choice for this patient, let's assume we'd already tried corneal GP and comfort was an issue, or ocular surface disease was a challenge that was confounding our case here, then we might choose scleral. How can we choose that initial lens? Well, let's go to that EH cord attribute, and we're going to average out these three readings taken across 0, 180, 30 degrees, three, sorry, 30 degrees, 210, and across 150, 330 degrees. So we're getting some sense of the height across the horizontal area. So we take that average, 4,000 microns, add in the fluid that you desire between lens and cornea, and that gives you the total sagittal depth that you need for your lens. Now, we use a lot of 
fluid on application. We target 300 to 400 microns on application of the lens, knowing that the lens is going to sink in about 125, maybe 150 microns. And that should leave us with possibly 200 to 300 microns of fluid. If you prefer less fluid layer, then just make your um, adjustment, your fluid thickness uh, factor a little bit lower. Now let's switch to a contact lens wear. And here's a 55 year old patient that is a very successful soft contact lens wearer. And as we know, it's not uncommon for our patients to hit their 40s and begin to drop out of soft lens wear due to dryness or presbyopia creeping in. Why was this patient so successful? And here's the topography. When we remove the contact lens, you see this patient's astigmatism and this kind of irregular inferior cornea. Is this the a sign of irregularity? Is this a, a diseased eye? The slit lamp signs were unremarkable and the vision was very good, 6-6 six, six vision with the uh, spherocylinder refraction. So it makes one question, what is this area here that we're looking at? Is that lid force constantly on the inferior cornea? When we look at this patient's fissure size, you notice the position of the upper and lower lid. Does that create does this lid position, create some pressure on the inferior cornea that's giving us this arc that you see here? Is the prism of the soft toric lens also creating extra pressure with that lid force? Is it an anomaly? Is it this topographical air? Is it a tear wedge across the inferior cornea? So there's a lot of things that it could be, but it appears that there isn't a tear wedge. The placido reflection was good. Uh, this patient may just have some molding effects of the lid force or the contact lens because all the slit lamp signs are saying and the vision is saying this is a healthy normal eye. Here's the tangential map and you notice the tangential is very sensitive to that inferior steepening. Now remember that axial is all about vision and axial map and all the topographies we've looked at to this point are axial maps. Here we have the tangential and this is the best interpretation for following eye shape. Where does the eye change in curvature radically? And you'll notice if we take this white line here through the most the um, axis of greatest curvature change, the, the cornea goes from flat curvature and gradually across the apex, rel relatively consistent spherical curvature. Then there's this radical change. It gets a lot steeper. And that's pretty typical of contact lens molding. An eye that's, that's unaltered by any type of lens molding or disease or post-surgical conditions will have a very gradual rate of change. So when you see a sudden shift in the curvature like this within a short uh, span of area, that is usually indication that we have some kind of molding or disease. And in this case, it's not disease, but it's most likely corneal molding. So why is this patient doing so well in soft lenses. Uh, for a 55 year old patient, you wouldn't expect them to be able to go from AM to PM. Uh, he told me that he wears his lenses about 18 hours a day sometimes and completely without issues. When we did a dry eye test on this patient, you notice a complete flat line of the tear film. And in other words, the tear film surface quality test is looking at the ring reflection over a span of time, in this case, about 15 seconds. The dark blue area is indicating to you the from point to point on each one of those rings, 
the tear film really shows no elevation change. It's completely smooth from one point to the next. Where you see the red, that's where the points appear to have more elevation shift. And that's pretty normal for us to see that toward the peripheral cornea. But the reason this patient is doing so well is they have an awesome tear film. This patient has a ideal surface tear film quality, and, and that's most likely why uh, soft lens wear is really a non-issue. Let's switch over and talk about the topography capture, the surface area of capture. And here we see our composite topography. And the reason why I personally love this map so much is that it gives me the ability to understand central cornea, uh, the peripheral or mid-peripheral cornea, where a rigid contact lens is going to touch down. So if I'm using the contact lens software, I understand the point where the lens lands. And then we get this far peripheral cornea right at the limbus or the visible iris diameter border. And that allows us to predict the sagittal depth of scleral lenses. So the composite map is really a very important corneal topography. And it's one that I would encourage you to use for all of your rigid lens fitting and all of your specialty contact lens fitting. Now, do you need to do a composite map for a screening? Patient comes in with slightly reduced quality of vision. Maybe they're not able to get quite to 6-6 vision. So you want a, an assessment of what's happening within the pupil. You want an assessment of whether there's any apex that's decentered from the, the cap of the cornea. Now, you really don't need a composite map for that. The extra imaging, the time that it takes to take the composite isn't that much greater, but nevertheless, we just want a screening. So in that case, just do a single topography capture. But if you're trying to build a 10.6 millimeter ortho K lens, then for sure you want this peripheral information out here. You wanna be able to predict the appropriate initial lens so your first fit success is high. If you're fitting a scleral lens, then being able to determine the angle of the peripheral cornea helps the Medmont to predict the entire anterior chamber depth. So the composite map of is very, very important for your specialty contact lens fitting. Now, sometimes we can't get a lot of information and this happens in cases like this. When you look at this topography, what would you imagine would create this surface of flat in the center, steep toward the periphery? What would limit the coverage of the rings in the peripheral cornea, giving us this smaller area of information? Well, it, the story, of course, is this is a corneal transplant patient, and uh, the rings are being lost as we his, hit that host donor transition area. Now, we could have done a composite topography to see if pushing the rings to the peripheral cornea would have allowed us to get a little more information. But this was a screening visit, so we didn't spend any extra time on doing that composite topography. Now let's look at the placido reflection. And you'll notice in the center, the cornea is very smooth, or at least the rings appear to be reflecting in this very regular manner. But as you near that approximate eight millimeter point where our host and donor cornea meet, where we have the scarring of those two surfaces healing with each other. You notice the rings are very close together as the cornea gets steeper, as the cornea gets a little more irregular. And that's why we see less information toward the periphery on this eye. Now let's pull up the elevation map. The axial map said the central cornea is relatively smooth. This patient should have decent vision with glasses, with soft lenses, with GP lenses. Um, but when we pull up the elevation, we see how challenging this eye shape is. What I want you to focus in on is the flat meridian here. The white line is crossing 
this axis and we're observing how the elevation of the eye is like a tabletop. For those of you who've been to Cape Town in South Africa, you may have seen uh, Table Mountain where you have this high elevation that's ultra flat and then the cornea just drops off. And this is a highly oblate eye. If we take the white line to the steeper or the more elevated axis of the eye, you see this real tilt. The cornea has this high elevation north of 100 microns and heading south we have this complete cliff as the eye just drops off. So this would be an, a very complex shape to attempt to build a corneal GP for. But I'm a stupid guy. What if I were to do it just to see what it looks like? And here is a specialty rigid lens designed for the irregular cornea. And you can uh, appreciate the challenge of fitting this patient. With such a tabletop of an eye shape, you see these elevated points where the contact lens wants to bear very far into the center and you get this grossly wide edge lift all the way around. So this patient is has no hope of being fit with a regular geometry GP lens, a lens that's steepest in the center, flattest toward the periphery. We need the complete reverse. This cornea is flat in the center, steep in the periphery. We need more of an ortho K like construction, not ortho K, but a reverse geometry lens where it's flat across the center, steep in the mid periphery. So what contact lens should we think about fitting this patient with? And certainly a soft lens may provide decent vision. Notice the corneal astigmatism is rather high. It's almost at three diopters. So if we can't keep the soft toric on axis, then rigid lens optics might be the consideration. Can corneal GP work? And I think looking at our model, it would suggest that a regular geometry GP lens is not the right call, but possibly a reverse geometry lens might be a consideration. Let's pull up the analysis details map. And what that does is gives you a little more finite analysis on some of the various indicators. And one of them that I use, especially when we're looking at a possible oblate eye, is the E squared value. Eccentricity is meant to describe a prolate corneal shape. It does not describe an oblate corneal shape. A post-refractive surgery patient as an example, or in this case, a transplant patient with an oblate flat in the center, steep in the periphery. So that's when we're gonna switch to E squared value. When you have greater than 0.25 negative E, centri sorry, negative e squared value, that's indicating a highly oblate surface shape. So if your eye is down to maybe negative 0.25 or less, then a regular geometry lens can often work. When it's greater than negative 0.25, then you typically need some kind of reverse geometry corneal GP. So this is an incredibly high oblate shape. And I'm a little bit worried that a corneal GP on this eye might struggle. We often find with our transplant patients that creating that appropriate lens to surface relationship is challenging for creating a uh, comfortable fit. And certainly with this eye being a, a very tilted graph, remember the elevation map told us this is an incredibly high point up here, and this is an incredible low point, a cliff, basically. So this is going to be challenging in rigid corneal GP lenses. Scleral might be the consideration with such an oblate surface. So how would we begin choosing our scleral lens? Well, it, again, we might go to the EH cord attributes and determine what is the height of this eye. And here we see that at a 15 millimeter cord, 
the sagittal depth of this cornea is incredibly high. It's estimated to be over 6,000 microns. Now, I don't know if I trust that it's exactly 6,000 microns. We really need a composite topography here to have an appreciation of this peripheral corneal angle and how that may run into the sclera. So doing a composite would give us much better perspective, but certainly the estimated height attribute is suggesting to you in your scleral lens set, do not choose the median sagittal depth. Do not choose the low sagittal depth. Go right to the highest depth in your fitting set. So I think this for this patient, the options are a little more narrow than they might be for the previous keratoconic patients that we looked at. Now let's consider ortho K. And what about this eye? Would you consider this patient a good candidate for orthokeratology? What do you look at that would indicate to you that this is a good K? Now, of course, we're going to look at the K readings. That gives us a starting point in radius. This cornea relatively flat, uh, 4133 or approximately uh, 815, 818, something like that in millimeters radius. So this is a relatively flat cornea. And you know in ortho K that typically steeper patients respond better to ortho K, flatter patients a little trickier. So if this were a minus eight myope with a 41 diopter uh, radius of cornea, I'm a little bit concerned we're gonna get anywhere near eight diopters. If this patient were a minus two or minus three patient, I wouldn't be so concerned with the flatter cornea. We can look at the corneal astigmatism. This patient has 0.92 or almost a diopter of corneal sill. That's very much within range of corneal, of, of, pardon me, of ortho K. Uh, for those of you who think in millimeters, that's about 0.2 millimeters of corneal astigmatism. So not a whole lot. What about eccentricity? Can this be used in ortho K? And uh, the early work in in orthokeratology told us that the higher the eccentricity, the better the patient responds to ortho K. So similarly to a flat cornea, a low E value would be considered a challenge. And as we discussed earlier, the normal eccentricity, middle of the bell curve for the, the um, normal eye is about 0.65. And this patient is coming up about 0.55. So that's a little lower than the norm. And again, if this were a minus eight myope and we were hoping to squeeze out eight diopters of flattening across the central cornea, I might be a little concerned that the E value was on the low side. If it were on the higher side, then maybe I'd feel a little more confident. So both the radius and the E value are telling us that we might have a little bit of a challenge. Now let's go down to the sagittal depth differential. And this is measuring the height of the cornea to an eight millimeter cord and describing for you, not the central corneal astigmatism, but the peripheral corneal sill. And in this case, this patient has a sagittal height difference between the flat and the steep meridian of 13 microns. What does that mean? Well, the height going all the way around the clock is virtually the same. It's only 13 microns difference between the flat and the steep meridian. That tells me that a symmetric ortho K lens should work quite successfully. When you're over, when you're 30 microns or over, that's when you typically want to think about a toric landing lens. Now, last is pupil. If we were fitting this patient with a five millimeter pupil, we would be pretty confident that we could push enough plus into the pupil for myopia control. The, the pupil size is large enough. We know the average adolescent pupil is about 5.4 millimeters in normal illumination. So if you've performed your topography with the lights on, um, then we should have at least some idea of the average pupil size in room lighting. 
Now, what about centration? Can you expect an ortho K lens to be well centered on this patient? And we might look at the axial or the tangential and draw circles around the green yellow border. That's approximately where your lens will touch down, where your alignment zone would be. And the same is true for corneal GPs. Where will the lens want to position in relationship to the visual axis here in the center? or the black pupil. And you notice that both of these dotted white rings appear to be pulled temporally. So if we fit this patient with a orthokeratology lens, you would expect the blue treatment zone to be slightly temporal of apex. Certainly both the tangential and the axial agree on that uh, topic. Now, if we pull up the elevation map, that tells us about height. Remember, red is where the eye is high. Blue is where the eye is low. What's the elevation map telling you? Well, red, yellow is closer on the nasal side, farther away on the temporal side from the visual axis or pupil. So that's suggesting as the lens find its e finds its equilibrium, you would expect the lens to want to fall toward this direction, move away from this highest point of elevation and find matching corneal height, find matching corneal shape. So the elevation map is also suggesting to us that a lens should ride temporal of apex. Now, when we do ortho -K on this patient and we see the outcome, what do we have here? What would you call this as a post-treatment response? And you know that in ortho -K, there are four topographical outcomes. Bullseye, meaning we did it perfectly. Smiley face, meaning the lens is riding high. Frowny face, meaning the lens is riding low. Or central island, meaning there's apical steepening. Well, is this a smiley face? Is that the paracentral steepening that's associated with a smiley face outcome? Or is this a frowny face outcome? Is that the upside down smile, the frown that's associated with a inferior outcome? Or is this a bullseye looking at the red ring following the pupil? It's certainly not a central island. There's no central steepening that we see here. Well, part of the problem that is that we are using an axial post-treatment and a tangential post-treatment. And we don't know the full story. We don't know what refractive change we created. We don't know what the treatment zone size was. We don't know what the absolute position of the lens was in the closed eye environment. All of these things we learn from something called a subtractive map. So in your MedMont, you can compare pre-ortho K topography to post-ortho K topography, A minus B equals C. So where you see blue, you know you flatten the cornea out. Where you see red, that's where you steepen the cornea when you compare this visit to this visit. So the subtractive, sometimes known as the difference map, or in the case of MedMont, known as a comparison map, is a orthokeratologist's best friend. This is the function you want to use for all of your analysis pre and post treatment. So what the axial subtractive map does is it tells us visual indicators. So as an example, we could look at the border of the blue treatment zone and say, does it cover 100% of the pupil? If we think of this like refractive surgery, did our ablation stretch its way across all the pupil borders to reduce the aberrations as much as possible and create the best possible vision for the patient? The axial map allows us to click our cursor right in the center of the topography and assess the power. In this case, 2.33 diopters Rx change. So you don't have to do a refraction post-treatment. Your axial subtractive map is going to tell you how much refractive change you created by comparing the radius of the eye before ortho-K to the radius of the eye on the visual axis after ortho-K. Okay. 
Now let's focus in on this graph down below. So this is the data across this white line across the flat meridian of the eye. And you'll notice that we have our paracentral steepening here outside the pupil. The dark gray area would be the pupil. Now, one of the concerns here is that we aren't seeing all of the information related to the central change. The graph or the scale goes from plus two to minus two, but our refractive change is 2.33 diopters in the center and maybe a little bit more here. So let's adjust the scale from plus or minus two to plus or minus three. So 100% of the refractive change falls within the borders of the graph. And now we can have a better appreciation of the power that you distributed within the pupil. It also will notice that the blue treatment zone appears a little bit temporal and that's what the elevation map and the axial and the tangential map suggested to us that the lens should want to position slightly temporal of the visual axis. Now let's switch over to the tangential map. This map does one thing and one thing only but a very important thing and that's to determine for us where the lens positions when the patient is sleeping. So look at the ring, this yellow, orange, red ring, and its position in relationship to the black pupil. This is a really well-centered response. I don't think any of us would argue that it's anything but a bullseye outcome, but um, we do see a slight temporal decentration. Now look at the red ring. This is where your reservoir is, your suction force that's pulling on the epithelium. And surrounding that blue is the blue ring, which is where your lens aligns with the eye surface, where it touches down and creates some mechanical molding. Now again, let's focus in on the scale here. And we have a plus or minus scale of three diopters. But you'll notice the peaks of effect on the tangential map go above and beyond that scale. So if we were to change the scale by clicking on this button right here, we can adjust it to go to a different range. If I go up to eight diopters, now I see 100% of the, ch the change within that axis on the graph. And it gives you a little more definition on the peaks and valleys of this effect. So for those of you who do orthokeratology or monitor refractive surgery patients, this subtractive map is an excellent way to do that. And you want to ensure that you're adjusting the scale specific to each patient. Now, sometimes I'm lazy and I just leave it on the two diopter scale and, and I, I might be missing a peak or a valley. But in general, um, adjusting the scale will give you more detail when you need it. Now here's a question, in this age of our concern for uh, patients and their growing myopia and the risk later in life, is this a good myopia controlling outcome? I think we can agree this is a really good bullseye, but is it a really good myopia controlling effect? Let's look at that dark gray area again, the area within the pupil across this white line, this axis line that you can take around the clock. And we can focus in on how we distribute power within the pupil. We have at least two studies now that show us the greater the spread of power within the pupil, the better the myopia control. And we might look at the most minus in the center, 2.33 diopters, and the least minus at the pupil border, about a half diopter, there's a distribution of 1.82 diopters of plus power. So if we're trying for myopia control, we know experts like Earl Smith III at the University of Houston tell us that push the most plus that's possible. Push the most plus that the patient can manage um, before the aberrations become bothersome and you need to back them off. In such a case, 
we want to ensure that we have pushed as much plus in this orthokeratology effect as we can. And 1.82 diopters would be considered reasonable, but is it meeting that ideal two and a half to three diopter range that we might really uh, desire or really have confidence that we're doing a good myopia controlling outcome? Another thing you can do is switch to the numeric meridian map. Um, and I only use this in myopia control. I find it just clutters the, the topography, at least for me personally, some practitioners prefer to know the radii all the way across the surface area. Well, let's zoom in on the center. We see that this patient goes from 2.4 diopters on the visual axis, so two and a half diopters of flattening, down to maybe 0.4 diopters near the pupil. So that's a two diopter shift in power or a two diopter add. If we compare the apex to heading superior, we go down to 1.2 diopters minus. So a one and a quarter diopter shift. If we head nasally, uh, sorry, temporally, we uh, drop about a diopter. So effectively a one add heading toward the temporal side. And then heading inferior, we drop down from 2.4 to minus a half, about a two diopter add. So this patient is getting a bit of plus, but I would prefer to see a smaller treatment area and a bigger power spread. That gives me more confidence that we're pushing lots of plus and slowing down that eye growth. Now, if this were adult ortho -K, we'd be super happy with this. The blue treatment zone is extending past the pupil 360 degrees. This is an excellent outcome for an adult, or at least we would expect it to be. Now, another thing we can do related to myopia control with our MedMont is comp to compare the aberrations pre and post treatment. There's a, a numerous studies now that tell us that we want to increase spherical aberration. We want to send it through the roof. The higher the spherical aberration post ortho K, the better the myopia control. Now the question is how much do we want to shift spherical aberration in an individual patient? And that is yet to be determined. We need to customize our ortho K for each individual eye. But let's agree that increasing spherical aberration is what we want to do. And the more we increase this value, the better. So more research needs to be done to understand that absolute shift and, or let's call it the, the average shift that we should see in most eyes. Now, just to finish up on this particular case, what do you see that might be concerning about the baseline topography that we've taken on this eye? And one of the things that's very positive is we go from steepest in the center to flattest in the periphery in a very gradual manner. We see a very regular figure eight hourglass shape. It's slightly asymmetric, but uh, this is a real kind of perfect eye to bend light, um, at least when we consider spherocylinder refraction. But looking north, you notice that the lid and eyelashes are limiting some of the coverage of the superior topography. And this is a reminder for your orthokeratology, when you're wanting to construct a lens, a rigid contact lens, do a composite topography. Don't just do a single map. Then we would understand a little more of the data up here. The other consideration is maybe I just did a really bad job of selecting my topographies. When we do a subtraction map and compare our baseline to our post-treatment, there's a lot more information on the post-treatment map. So apparently I've just done a terrible job of selecting or capturing my topographies. So the point of this conversation is consider how important your baseline pre-ortho-K topography is in ortho-K analysis.
not only is it important to calculate the first lens that you place on eye, but all of the subtractions that we do from here may have this missing information because you're comparing an, a topography with a smaller fissure of capture versus a topography with a larger fissure of capture. We're always going to be missing this data. So your baseline map is the most important topography you ever take in OrthoK. It's the one that we are always going to use to compare yesterday versus today, yesterday versus next week's visit, yesterday versus next month, six months from now, 10 years from now. This map is always the reference point that you will be using with your subtraction. Now let's switch over to another slightly normal eye. And is this a patient that would require a toric GP lens? And we might look at the corneal astigmatism and we would say that this eye has a very regular, uh, very low amount of corneal cylinder. So would, it, would this patient require a toric rigid lens? And based on corneal cylinder, that's about 0.25 millimeters of corneal astigmatism. One and a quarter diopters is almost nothing. But let's look at other indicators. We compare the eccentricity of the flat, 0.71 versus 0.9, sorry, 0.19. When you see a big differential between the two E values, that's telling you there's a big height differential in the periphery. So that might be indication we need a toric lens. Let's look at the sag differential. And here we see that this patient has a 37 micron difference in the height of the eye this way versus the height of the eye this way. Remember when you're at 0.3 millimeters of cornea, sorry, 0.3 Apologies, everybody, <laughs> when you're at 30 microns or greater of sagittal differential, that's when you want to consider using a toric rigid lens and a toric ortho -K lens. Now, when we look at the elevation map, we can observe where the high points are, where our contact lens will land. That's here and here. We can look at where the lens will lift. That's 12 and 6 o'clock, where the eye elevation is dropping. So all of these topographies can provide us with information. The axial map is saying this patient should refract to a very high level of visual acuity. The tangential map is saying there's some steep spots up here that might affect lens position. It might want to fall into that steep spot where the lid force is quite high, possibly molding the eye. The elevation map is telling you the lens is going to land at around 2.30 and 8.30 on the clock face. It's going to lift the most at around 11.30 and 5.30. So all of these topographies are able to give us some guidance. Now, another consideration is how would we build a lens for this eye? And the first step is to measure the visible iris diameter. We have a VID of about 12 and a quarter um, millimeters. Let's pull up the contact lens software. Let's model the fitting of a large diameter GP lens. And across the flat meridian, we see the lens landing beautifully at around 8.30 and 2.30, just where the elevation map said it would. And just like the elevation map said, along the steep meridian, we're going to have pooling at 11.30 and 5.30. When your fluid layer is over around 30 or 40 microns, that's when the lens begins to rock back and forth, begins to tilt on eye, and likely will be moving too much and less comfortable. So let's build a toric for this patient. Create good landing across 3 and 9 o'clock that we can see here and here. Then on the steep axis, we're going to use a toric lens with a much 
deeper elevation across the steep axis of that contact lens. And now you see this beautiful alignment all the way across. The tear layer isn't getting thicker and thicker until you hit the edge lift. So this should create a much more stable contact lens landing on eye. Now, if we were to fit an ortho K, let's just go through this final case. Apologies, I'm running a little bit over time, but let's fit ortho K on this particular eye. And the same story is true across the flat meridian. You see you're landing at three o'clock and nine o'clock. Then on the steep axis, if we use a symmetric ortho K lens, the alignment zone is going to be a mile off the eye surface. Notice it's in the neighborhood of 70 or 80 microns before the edge lift kicks in. So this patient clearly needs a deeper uh, meridian across the steep axis. So let's fit a toric ortho K lens, similarly to how we fit the toric conventional GP. On the flat meridian, we'll create our landing at three and nine o'clock or close to three and nine o'clock. Then on the steep axis, we'll create a much deeper reverse curve and a completely different alignment zone shape so that our lens shows this parallel tier layer thickness all the way across. And that way the lens has less room to rock back and forth to decenter and possibly cause our treatment to be off-center on eye. So the MedMont contact lens software is this awesome function that we have within the corneal topographer that allows us to build our lenses and optimize the fit in this theoretical environment so we can create a high first fit success rate. Hey guys, I hope this uh, potpourri of examples has been beneficial in providing perspective on uh, various ways we might approach um, the, the corneal topography analysis. Um, I'm going to thank Chris for setting up this session. Uh, Chris, could I hand the session over to you um, after I thank, and thanks everybody, by the way, for, for coming on and uh, being with us. Chris, please take over. Cheers. Uh, thanks again, Randy. Sincerely appreciate your time as always. Uh, very, very interesting um, webinar. Um, I'd also like to thank once again our, uh, our co-sponsors as well too, um, NIDEC uh, USA. I'd also like to thank iVinci, number seven contact lens, MedCornea, Soflex in Israel, Belgian Optical, ConLens, and uh, Belosa in Austria. Uh, I'd also uh, highly recommend that you uh, reach out to uh, any one of the distributors, aforementioned distributors that I've uh, that I've talked to, I uh, just talked about, and ask them for uh, either a pricing if you're interested in purchasing, or also if a for a virtual demo as well too. I can sincerely guarantee that you're not going to get as good a pricing on as corner topographer uh, now as you would at uh, this particular time. Thanks again, all. Uh, thank you again once for your questions, and we look forward to seeing you on May 28th. Take care. All the best. Bye-bye.